Hello, everyone. I'm Ginny Steele. I'm the Norman and Armina Powell University Librarian at UCLA and delighted to be with you today. It's great to have everybody here. And we have uh, some wonderful speakers this afternoon. So I'm so happy that you'll have the opportunity to hear from them. As we get started, I wanted to note that as an academic institution, we in the UCLA Library understand our responsibility to acknowledge the Gabrielino Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tovangar. And consistent with UCLA's commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, we believe that understanding the historical and current experiences of indigenous peoples will help inform the work we do. So again, thank you for coming today. I just wanted to give you a, a few quick updates on what's happening in the library. Uh, as you know, the last 16 months have been a time of, of quite a bit of change for us uh, during the pandemic. We started and for the first roughly year of the pandemic, all of our library buildings were closed, but we transitioned almost all of our services to be remotely available. And we've seen an increase in use of those services. In some cases, uh, a 500 or 600% increase in use of our website and of the many digital resources that we make available. Starting in April, we reopened some study space in the Young Research Library and also in the Biomedical Library. And then uh, in May, we opened the reading room in Library Special Collections for use. Our plan at this point, barring unforeseen circumstances, is to reopen all of our libraries in September right after Labor Day. So of course that all depends on what happens with the pandemic, but, but we're very hopeful and we're really eager to get back to campus and see students, see faculty, see everyone who works there and be together as, as people. Discussion going on about the concept of flex work because we now know that it's possible for people to be extremely productive uh, by working remotely. And so we're engaged in conversations with everyone who works in the library to figure out how we can make it possible for people to be able to work remotely um, some of the time or possibly even all of the time. Although recognizing that um, there are people who will need to be on campus because their jobs require them to be physically present in the libraries. So lots going on, lots for us to think about. But today, what we're thinking about is our library prizes. This is something we do every year, and we're really pleased that we're able to continue this program even during the pandemic. So we gave our prizes out last spring and spring of 2020, and we've also given our prizes out uh, this year in 2021. And this is the way that we honor a few of the amazing students at UCLA. And these particular students are ones who have distinguished themselves with their passion for learning and pursuing knowledge. So each of the students we recognize today has demonstrated remarkable intellectual curiosity, as well as the skills and capacities to conduct meaningful research. The projects they have produced are compelling, thought-provoking, and inspiring to their faculty, librarians, and peers. We believe strongly that these students' accomplishments deserve a broad audience, and we know their research efforts will be compelling to graduate schools and future employers. We are really grateful for the opportunity to showcase and celebrate their achievements today. So just um, a little bit about the library prizes. The inspiration for the UCLA Library Prize for Undergraduate Research 
comes from Ruth Simon, who's a UCLA alumna, former UCLA campus counsel, and passionate supporter of books and libraries. Ruth has generously endowed the awards being that we have presented to these students to inspire and reward the work they do and their excellence in library research. So congratulations to all our winners. And I think there we go. There's the list of all of our winners. So uh, wonderful to see and fascinating work. So today we do have uh, a, a few of the prize winners who are going to talk about the projects they did. So I will just turn the floor over to first to Anisha Chandra, who is sharing her project, The Role of Diet and Exercise in the Gut Microbiota and Metabolism. And just wanted to note that health policy and management professor William McCarthy was the faculty sponsor for this project. So Anisha, over to you. Thank you, Jenny. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. And I'm going to be talking about the role of diet and exercise in the gut microbiota and metabolism. Next slide. So first, just to put some things in context, the gut microbiota consists of trillions of microbes in our large intestines, and they impact us more than we may realize. About 99% of microbes are beneficial or harmless, and there has been plenty of research connecting them to metabolic diseases like obesity. Given that the obesity rate in America is 42%, understanding the gut microbiota can help develop interventions to address it. Next slide. So one of the reasons why the gut microbiota is so important is because it fulfills important functions for the hosts, like producing metabolites, which are pr products of metabolism. One such metabolite is short chain fatty acids, which I will be referring to throughout this presentation. Short chain fatty acids are produced when the dietary fiber we ingest is degraded into monoaminoglycosaccharides and then fermented by our gut bacteria into short chain fatty acids. These short chain fatty acids then act on different organs in the body and affect microbial diversity, satiety, immunity, and other things. There's also been the discovery of short chain fatty acid receptors across a range of cell and tissue types. So that's another reason why there's a lot of interest in short chain fatty acids right now. Next slide. So the reason I focus on diet and exercise is because they are two of the major factors that influence the composition and diversity of the gut microbiota as seen in the top of this figure. The composition of the gut microbiota then in turn affects the permeability of the gut barrier as we move down the figure and the metabolites that the gut microbes produce. These metabolites may include short chain fatty acids and gut hormones among others, and they act on major organs to influence metabolic health. Next slide. So I wanna clarify that all of my research comes back to the idea that a more diverse gut microbiota is a healthier microbiota because different bacteria have different abilities and fulfill different functions for the host. If the host gut microbiota is less diverse, it is more at risk of dysbiosis, which is in, an imbalance in gut microbes. As shown in the figure on the right, a diet or exercise intervention may or may not be effective for the host due to the composition of their gut microbiota. In the gut microbiota of non-responders, which is in the bottom half of the figure, the host does not have the diversity of microbes necessary to respond effectively to a generally beneficial activity like exercise. Next slide. And diet and exercise have long been established as contributors to human health, of course, but less is known about the way they interact. It is a common misconception that exercise is not as important if one is eating a healthy diet, but the relationship goes both ways. Currently, there is a lack of studies that take both diet and exercise into account uh, and their effect on a non-dysbiotic gut or healthy gut in other terms has basically not been studied. So some questions that remain include, what is the difference between consuming a fiber diverse diet and exercising frequently versus just doing one or the other? 
And the mechanisms by which exercise improves the gut microbiota also requires further exploration. Next slide. So through an analysis of existing human and animal research, my research will discuss how either diet or exercise affect short chain fatty acid production, microbial diversity, and gut barrier integrity. And then I'll talk about the individual effects diet and exercise have on these factors to discuss what their combined effect may be. So we've already discussed short chain fatty acid production. So now we'll move on to microbial diversity. Next slide. So the explanation as to why a fiber diverse diet improves microbial diversity is pretty simple uh, because more diverse sources of fiber provide food for a greater variety of microbes. A more complex question is distinguishing between high quantities of fiber and high quantities of diverse fibers. Among the existing literature, Zhao et al. best demonstrates the need to eat not only fiber-rich foods, but also a fiber-diverse diet. In this study, diabetes patients receive either a fiber-rich and fiber-diverse diet or a control diet but the treatment group showed consistent improvements in several parameters, including butyric acid as shown in the figure, which is a precursor to one of the short chain fatty acids I mentioned. This implies that the fiber diverse diet allows short chain fatty acid producing bacteria to thrive more. Next slide. On the other hand, the mechanism by which exercise increases gut diversity is less well known, but the association has been established. The figure on the left shows that the gut microbiota of professional rugby athletes had a higher diversity of gut microbes. And then the figure on the right shows that the peak oxygen uptake or VO2 max, which is a value that indicates fitness levels correlated with higher microbial diversity that could not be accounted for by the diet. Next slide. So now we're gonna move on to discussing gut barrier integrity. And one reason why it's important to have a strong gut barrier is that it prevents oxygen from entering the gut, which is good because most beneficial gut microbes are anaerobic, meaning they survive uh, without oxygen. And this includes short chain fatty acid producing microbes. But in this figure, it shows the case of diet induced obesity where changes to the gut microbiota may result in downregulating the proteins responsible for this gut barrier. This allows stuff like oxygen and lipopolysaccharides to leak into the gut and facilitates the expansion of harmful microbes. Next slide. And then this figure on the right demonstrates that a diet rich in uh, microbiota accessible carbohydrates, which on the figure is termed HFMAC. Um, this is basically just fiber. This prevented the degradation of the gut barrier in diet-induced obese mice. And now with regards to exercise, there have only been associations made again between exercise and gut barrier function. But one possible explanation is that during exercise, since oxygen is directed elsewhere in the body towards the muscles, um, this promotes an anaerobic environment in the gut, allowing short chain fatty acid producers to thrive. Next slide. So now we've talked about how diet and exercise exert similar effects on the gut microbiota. And as for how diet affects exercise, the literature implies that a fiber rich and fiber diverse diet enhances the effectiveness of exercise. Consuming a variety of fibers feeds the anaerobes of the gut, allowing for increased production of short chain fatty acids, which help preserve the gut barrier. Exercise is more effective if the gut barrier is strong, as oxygen is more efficiently distributed to the muscles rather than leaking into the gut where it is not wanted. This figure on this slide here further highlights the relationship between diet and exercise as mice fed high fat diet when they were supplemented with any of the three short chain fatty acids, they had higher energy expenditure, despite no changes in activity levels. So far, what we know supports the notion of a plant-based diet as plant-based foods are rich in fiber. Next slide. As for how exercise affects diet, here are a couple of hypotheses. 
The first is that exercise alters taste sensitivity, which has been shown in human studies, though these studies are a little dated at this point. After exercise, individuals have been shown to have less hunger and increased taste sensitivity to sweet foods in particular, which basically means that sweet foods taste sweeter uh, after exercise than they did before exercise. And this may be related to a separate theory called sensory specific satiety, which basically just means that as food is consumed, preference for that food declines, which I'm sure we have all experienced to some extent before. So uh, increased taste sensitivity may lead to preference declining quicker because individuals may redirect their hunger to foods with different tastes. And as we know, redirecting our hunger to uh, diversity of foods would also support microbial diversity. And finally, we have all also probably experienced preference for water after exercise. So this may extend to uh, include cravings for water bearing foods, which include fiber rich fruits and vegetables. And yeah. next slide. And studies have also shown that exercise impacts appetite control parameters like hormones. And while the mechanism for this is still unclear, both studies in mice and humans have shown that reduced hunger hormones um, and increased satiety hormones are there after exercise. Next slide. So the bottom line here after looking at all of these different factors is that eating a fiber rich, fiber diverse and minimally processed diet and staying active produces short chain fatty acids, which allow for a diverse gut microbiota with a strong gut barrier. Short chain fatty acids exert various beneficial metabolic effects on the host and diet and exercise in general may also have effects on satiety, taste sensitivity and more. Next slide. So what I used for my research was a variety of sources from human clinical trials, animal experiments, bench research, reviews, books, and web articles. And I accessed uh, most, I mostly used papers and I asked them, accessed them from the various databases, all while connected to UCLA VPN. And when I did not have access to a particular paper, I checked it out from the UCLA library. Next slide. And finally, I would just like to thank my mentor, Dr. William McCarthy from the Fielding School of Public Health and uh, the UCLA library for all of its donors and for making this event and um, the library prize possible. And thank you all for listening and I will be passing it back to Ginny. Thank you so much, Anisha. It's really great to have the opportunity to hear about your project. Our next project that we're going to hear about is uh, from J.W. Clark, whose project was titled Voicing the Fox, Bullpine Bodies and the Zoo Politics of Listening. And musicology professor Benjamin Court was the faculty sponsor. J.W. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, next slide, please. In her 1992 ethnography of a fox hunting community in New Jersey's Pine Barrens, anthropologist Mary Hufford writes, quote, the fox, neither holy dog nor holy cat, mediates the oppositions it embodies. Male and female, nature and culture, home and abroad, sociable and unsociable, food and not food, insider and outsider, concrete and abstract. As a cat-like dog on the margins of society, the fox, the fox also threatens the reality that rests on such agreed upon distinctions, end quote. Her situated account signals a pervasive historical trend that reaches much wider than the mid-Atlantic. Foxes have long occupied a liminal space in the Western cultural imaginary, favorites of storytellers, folklore, and mythology, yet often vilified due in part to their uncomfortable proximity to humanness, particularly in behavior and appearance. As suggested by the binary separate supplies, Humans have particular trouble apprehending those they perceive as charming, but a thief, as alluring, but a stinky pest, and paradoxically under anthropocentric regimes, as an animal that is intelligent. Next slide. And so advancing a specific, meaning species specific approach to representational analysis, um, my project gives close attention to how red foxes, or, or those we usually call vulpus vulpus, have been constituted through sound in Western cultural contexts. 
Um, and I structure this project uh, in this way for a number of reasons. Um, first, I hope to resist defaulting to the animal as an essentialized category. Investigations mounted on representations of the animal, particularly in humanistic approaches, often subsume vast varieties of species life under a catch-all umbrella term, generalizing to a point where other animals simply become a homogenized other. And this discursive tendency is the same that prompted Jacques Derrida in his famous lectures on the subject to replace l'animal with l'animal, signaling through his wordplay neither a species nor gender nor an individual, but an irreducible living multiplicity of mortals contained in that common label of alterity. And so in order to do justice to species difference, I actively refute the violent effacing anthropocentrism that draws the line between the human and the animal. Additionally, this work also stems from an implicit conviction that as my advisor remarked in one of our discussions on the topic, um, that foxes are people. Historically, foxes have garnered equal parts admiration and disgust from humans, sentiments which only become amplified as we translate them into various human media. The hypocritical proximity to humanness that we afford red foxes in our mythologies and perhaps to a greater extent our, our cultural commodities is starkly contrasted with their historical categorization as pests as well as the existence of the fur farming industry that takes so many of their lives. Although we, we might even want to ask, are pests not construed as liminal figures themselves, situated as they are between constructions of civilization and wilderness, both in scare quotes there. Um, and, and crucially, my interest in red foxes mirrors aspects of anthropologist Anat Singh's motivation for studying the Matsutake mushroom as it exists within globalized commodity chains. And so just as Singh's Matsutake flourishes under what are usually regarded as destructive anthropogenic interventions, red foxes have proved time and again their penchant for resilience despite the havoc capitalism continues to wreak on global ecologies. With the habitat distribution encompassing practically the entire Northern Hemisphere, they thrive not only in biomes considered perhaps relatively distant from direct human contact, such as forests, although we might even want to push on what, what uh, constitutes something that is distant from human contact in this day and age, um, but also in bustling urban centers built by humans as well. And so here I want to ask what lessons can we learn from those who themselves have learned to live in the midst of degraded, precarious neoliberal meccas? And next slide. And so with, with red foxes at the center of my inquiry, I give primary attention in this project to three cultural sites wherein acts of what I call voicing occur. Um, next slide. Uh, my deployment of the term voicing here denotes not only a fluid process in action, but also remains intentionally fuzzy and multivalent in its usage. Voicing can and often does take many disparate forms, only some of which involve musical behavior of the traditional sort. And so sites of voicing or to borrow language from voice study scholars, Nina Eidsheim and Catherine Meisel, performances of claims to voice need only entail a projection of voice by a perceived subject onto some sort of perceived object. Um, in other words, a site of voicing may be really any case where the voice heard does not emanate directly from the individual group that is being spoken for. And so in this case, it's humans doing the speaking for other animals. Uh, next slide. And so I begin by locating the red fox in the early 20th century European musical imaginary, showing how Leo Janacek's 1924 opera, The Cunning Little Vixen, situates its titular fox within a decisively folkloric tradition, the recourse to representational strategies reliant on stereotypes derived from Aesopian and later Renardian traditions of the animal fable. And so here I contend that sound in The Cunning Little Vixen functions as a tool to signal not only species difference, but differences in moral status by analyzing how Janacek articulates, fox, articulates rather foxiness and the lack thereof um, during the opera's act one finale. As a stereotypical fox in the hen house scene, the act one finale is a notable in at least three ways that I kind of triangulate. Um, so first, Janacek confers a different degree of personhood upon the cock and the hens than the vixen through their vocal lines and sonic profiles. Second, Janacek's textual characterization of the vixen relies heavily on preconceived notions of foxiness, both drawn from naturalistic observation and from folkloric characterizations. And third, the scene and the opera as a whole more generally capitalizes on a collective perception that the presence of other animals in a musical work indexes non-seriousness, whimsicality, and childishness, childishness rather. And so at around the turn of the century, we get this really pervasive association between the child and the animal as, as kind of discrete categories in all sorts of media, which is something that continues to the present day. If you look at it, the proliferation of non-human characters in children's media, it's, it's pretty obvious. So that's something I'm interested in kind of tracking. Um, next slide. 
And so next I interpret Mary Hufford's 1992 ethnography of a New Jersey fox chase through linguistic anthropologist and ethnomusicologist Stephen Feld's theorizations of acoustomology. Acoustomology, which, which more or less makes up uh, the foundations of modern sound studies, advocates that we listen to histories of listening and posits the sonic as a relational side of knowledge production, attending to the complex webs of multi interspecies politics that often accompany practices of listening and storytelling. And so for Feld, Acoustomology is, quote, grounded in the basic assumption that life is shared with others in relation, with numerous sources of action that are variously human, non-human, living, non-living, organic, or technological, end quote. And so it kind of seeks to collapse these boundaries while also kind of respecting um, their discreteness and their difference. Um, and so by identifying the ways in which Pine Barrens fox hunting articulates a relational politics evaluation predicated on species membership, I show how assessments of non-human vocality operate within the logics of the chase. And additionally, highlighting contradictions inherent in epistemologies of the hunt, wherein the well-being of foxes is prioritized even as, a, even as they are relentlessly pursued for sport, um, I ask what might be the implications of giving voice to those caught up in the violent human tradition of fox hunting, be they canine, human, or otherwise? And then further, how might these seemingly reverential anthropomorphisms obscure perhaps more insidious hierarchies of transspecies power? Next slide. And, and finally, by way of conclusion, I, I pivot a little bit to social media ethnography to discuss a 2011 viral YouTube video taken of Kevy, a red fox rescued from a fur farm. Titled Kevy Sings a Pretty Song, the video depicts Kevy vocalizing while lying on the floor of a room in the home of her human caretaker. While the chirps and trills Kevy voices are presumably meant to be in the service of interspecific communication, so to fox to fox communication, um, user comments display an overwhelming interpretation of this behavior as singing. And so reading these interpretations as a paradoxical bestowal of personhood, qua the otherworldly singing voice, and, and then positioning the clip next to a recent explosion in popularity of internet videos and, and other content featuring rescue foxes, I draw attention to a tendency in popular discourse that often consists in the infantilization and exoticization of those they presume to speak for. Next slide. And so, so as a whole, this project is, is more or less an argument that these instances of voicing that I highlight, um, so musical representation, socio nature, cultural traditions of hunting, listening and storytelling, um, and anthropomorphic appeals to personhood via those who co-construct um, public internet discourse, that all of these things are necessarily um, zoopolitical in the manner Fabian Ludueña uses the um, originally Derridian term to refer to the exclusion of certain bodies from, quote, the political community of humans. Um, and so by drawing attention to the act of giving voice to red foxes specifically, and, and other animals more, an animals more generally, I mean to throw into relief actions that presume to speak for those whose voices are denied or eclipsed by zoopolitics of exclusion. Placing these seemingly disparate sites of performance together in conversation enables us to think more critically about the extent to which we continually silence and replace the voices of other animals with our own and provides us with the conceptual foundations to listen to certain histories of interspecific violence, both epistemic and corporeal. Um, and so following Stephen Feld, I propose we need to listen to histories of listening to the ways we have voiced other forms of life in order to grapple with persistent structures of human exceptionalism. And so my point here is that dynamics of power always accompany invocations of the non-human voice. Ultimately, listening, listening is an active mode of construction and creation. Just as our listening is always political and, and to a degree always so political, entangled as it is with embedded assumptions about that and those to which we listen, listening to our histories of listening and histories of voicing is to necessarily engage with and unsettle traditions of naturalized thought involved in our relating to and relating with others. Next slide. Some acknowledgements and, and thank you so much. And now I'll turn it back over to Gina. Thank you so much, JW. Really, again, a very interesting project that you did. So our next speaker is Tamar Urban, who will present on her project, Machine Learning Detection of Coronal Holes. And atmospheric and ocean science professor Jacob Bortnick was the faculty sponsor for this one. Tamar, over to you. Thank you, Ginny. Um, and thank you to the UCLA Library for putting this on. Um, so hi, my name is Tamar. I'll be presenting on a project I've been working on for the past year and a half. 
looking at um, modeling and detecting solar coronal holes. Next slide, please. So what are coronal holes and why do we care about them is kind of a big overarching thing to understand in order to put this project into context. Um, but solar coronal holes are regions of cold low density plasma in the solar corona. And the solar corona is basically just the outermost layer of the sun. And these coronal holes are relevant um, to our lives because they are areas of open magnetic field lines. And from these areas of open field lines, we see a fast acceleration of the solar wind. And these energetic particles can interact with Earth's, with Earth's magnetosphere and um, create some of the large scale solar storms we see and the Northern Lights. Similarly, active regions are also other magnetically dynamic regions on the solar surface. And these in contrast to the dark um, low density solar coronal holes, active regions are actually bright areas of magnetically dynamic plasma. And these are um, the areas where large scale solar, solar storms kind of begin, such as solar flares and coronal mass ejections. And these types of solar storms can greatly impact our lives here on Earth. Um, solar particles and plasma can interact with Earth's outer atmosphere um, and induce perturbations in our magnetic fields. And this can cause breakdowns in our power grids and infiltrate and kind of mess with um, telecommunication systems, both space and ground based. Um, next slide, please. And so for this project, I use solar disk images, which is basically an image of the solar corona um, taken at one instance in time. And these images have inherent issues with them that need to be corrected for before you can really do anything with this data. Um, and these sort of corrections have been done previously in um, different computer science languages that are kind of now obsolete. And so this project really wanted to work on kind of modernizing the system and creating a, a community oriented package that could be used by the solar physics community. So the two main corrections that um, I had to correct for in my solar disk images were limb darkening and intensity variation across instruments. So limb darkening basically occurs when the outer limb of the sun gets darker because of our um, distance from the outside of the sun to the sphere. And we need to ensure that our intensity variation is pretty much constant across the solar disk. So the first correction we do is to account for the center to limb intensity variations. And that's this first plot in the top right. And we can see that between our original line of sight disk image and our corrected um, image, there's kind of a difference in terms of the intensity on the outer limb. The next uh, intensity correction we work on is known as inner instrument intensity transformations. And this is basically looking to account for intensity variations between instruments. So when we want to map um, a bunch of solar data onto the full sun surface, so rather than just a solar disk, but actually get a 360 view of the whole sun, we need to use data from multiple different instruments. And because these instruments have kind of been in space for varying amounts of times, um, they have different resolutions, they have different number of CCDs, which means they can detect um, different intensities of light. Um, there's kind of intensity differences between these instruments that we see when we build the full sun map. So it's super important that we normalize these to a reference instrument to ensure that our final full sun maps don't look kind of weird and we don't see the cutoffs between data from different instruments. Um, so that was the second correction that I accounted for. Um, next slide, please. And so once we are, um, account for all of these necessary corrections to our data, we're able to move on to the actual more science part of this project, which is how do we detect the solar regions we care about? And so because detection of solar regions is super fuzzy and kind of not really um, a prominently solved problem in solar physics, um, I decided that machine learning was a good way to go about improving our detection methods and also removing implicit biases that the user, the coder has when um, building this type of detection scheme. And so machine learning is useful because it allows you to tell the machine what to do or your computer rather than you making threshold detection um, without you making these threshold detections that kind of um, lead to this implicit user bias. And so the first so, uh, machine learning algorithm I built was a supervised machine learning model known as a convolutional neural network. And so a supervised machine learning model basically maps training examples um, using an input output pattern. And this means that we feed this algorithm 
both unlabeled data or what's seen on the left, these solar disk images, as well as labeled data or previously thresholded coronal hole detections. And the model is going to work on figuring out how can we map this solar disk image to this detection, uh, do it a bunch of times until the model is optimized, and then apply it to new data. And so this is great because we can compare a prediction to a desired output, kind of plot the error and determine when our model has converged. Um, and additionally, we validate this model using data it has never seen before, known as validation data. Next slide, please. And so after doing this, we're able to merge all of our um, detections, as well as data from a bunch of different instruments, and create kind of a full map of the sun. So this is a full map of the sun, meaning that if you imagine the sun is like a globe, um, and you kind of put a slice in the globe and then rolled it out, this is basically what you'd get, but now we're doing it on the sun. Um, and doing this, we're able to create a full sun detection of coronal holes. We do see some like remnants of the mapping um, in some of these active regions, but overall the big coronal hole structures and features that we care about are detected well. Next slide, please. And so while supervised machine learning provides like a great result in terms of our detections, um, it does have some user biases because I had to put in um, previously detected coronal hole maps. Um, and this was based off of what I thought was a coronal hole. And since there is no textbook definition of a coronal hole, I kind of wanted to look at, okay, what are other ways that we can do this detection such that we remove my personal definition or someone else's personal definition of what this solar feature really is. So unsupervised machine learning is perfect for this type of problem because it requires no labeled data from the user. So unsupervised um, ML algorithms basically take a bunch of unlabeled data and it sorts them based upon the algorithm that you write or the algorithm, algorithm of your choosing. Um, and it sorts the data such that it, the data in one cluster is very similar to the other data in its cluster, but very different from the data from other clusters. So the algorithm I used is a pretty commonly used machine learning algorithm. It's known as k-means, and it basically just labels unlabeled data. And so this is cool because it allows us to detect both coronal holes in active regions, which is something we haven't been able to do before. And the basic idea of the algorithm is that it iteratively, iteratively assigns a bunch of observations or samples to a certain number of clusters, which is kind of what you see here in the figure. Um, and this is optimized based off a bunch of user specified hyperparameters. So these were parameters that I decided on um, to kind of optimize my model. And so some of these parameters included what data do we input for clustering? How do we normalize this data? How do we weight it kind of to get the results that we want and that we expect? And so coronal holes in active regions are normally um, identified using what's known as intensity thresholding. So we basically say anything that's darker than this is a coronal hole, anything that's brighter than this is an active region. And so using that philosophy, um, the first thing we kind of want to look for in terms of clustering is clustering by intensity. Um, but we also want to ensure that our detection is spatially continuous. So this means that rather than having blobs here and here, we're able to connect them into like a actually coherent detection. And so because of this, uh, my model clustered both using spatial data and intensity data, which were those full sun disk images that I showed previously. And in addition to needing to cluster by um, these two pieces of data, we also wanted to look at how are we going to normalize this and weight this data. Um, and based off a bunch of optimization trials that I ran, kind of trying to remove myself from the equation and see what the um, what algorithms can come up with. I determined that it worked a lot better if we weighted the intensity data a little bit more strongly and normalized both intensity and spatial data on the same scale. Next slide, please. Thanks. Um, so here is a final full sun map um, with overlaid coronal hole detections in red and active region detections in blue. Um, in comparison to the supervised machine learning algorithm, um, this did a lot better. And we I ran a bunch of trials and tracked a lot of um, area components and coronal holes, um, number of coronal holes per like synchronic timestamp um, and kind of concluded that overall, this was a much better method of detecting both coronal holes and active regions. And um, this is super useful because it's, really user independent. So anybody can go in and use this algorithm and detect the same coronal holes as I would. Whereas before what I was using kind of was 
very dependent upon threshold um, intensity values that you chose. And so this sort of map and these detections are super useful for building robust model of the sun and improving our understanding of how the solar corona evolves over time and how this can affect life here on Earth. Um, and moving forward, I will most likely this fall be continuing to work on this project and looking at how we can create sort of prediction capabilities to determine where you will find coronal holes maybe tomorrow or in the next week or so um, and continuing to use machine learning to do so. Next slide, please. Um, so that's really all I had. I wanna thank the UCLA Library again for providing access to all these resources in such an easy way to find, um, and also funding from NASA and the United States Air Force for this project. And thank you, I'll pass it back to Ginny. Thank you so much, Tamar. Another really fascinating presentation. So we have one more today, and uh, I know it will be equally intriguing. So I will like now introduce Kristen Tam, who will present her project that's entitled Stimulating Antitrust Enforcement to Expand the Regenerative Agriculture Movement. Law Professor William Boyd was the faculty sponsor for this. Over to you, Kristen. Thank you, Jenny. Hello, everyone. Have you ever played the game called Anti-Monopoly? Maybe a few? Well, I'm assuming most of you have not nonetheless even heard of this game. That's because building a monopoly is seen as the prize goal for our society. Building a monopoly is where you're able to make the most profit and even bully out other competitors, allowing you to set the prices that you want where you can dominate the marketplace. Although this is a board game analogy, corporate monopolies and conglomerates can freely outcompete smaller businesses and rule the market. This issue has directly occurred in the agricultural industry, causing many small farmers to be put out of business. That is where antitrust laws come in. My name is Kristen Tam, and I'm a rising third year undergraduate from San Francisco studying environmental science. And this past year, I authored a legal research paper called Stimulating Antitrust Enforcement to Expand the Regenerative Agriculture Movement that was recently published in the UCLA Undergraduate Law Journal. Growing up in a city far removed from where my food comes from has intrigued me in discovering how these processes work. After learning about how destructive our current monoculture industrial farming industry is on the planetary and societal health, I knew there had to be a better way to grow food in a way that's profitable and in harmony with nature systems. With agriculture contributing to 10.5% of greenhouse gas emissions, the way that we manage land and farms, switch please, can either contribute to carbon emissions or act as a carbon capturer, switch. In comparison to industrial agriculture, regenerative farming practices, which I learned about, are more closed looped and includes no-till planting cover crops and applying compost, food scraps, and animal manure as a natural fertilizer, creating a closed loop cycle where our outputs become farming's inputs. This helps to reduce our reliance on chemical fertilizers and farms in a way that's more natural. Switch. After learning about the benefits of regenerative agriculture, I wanted to research ways that we can use our legal system to support more regenerative farming. While doing preliminary research, I stumbled upon a research paper by Iowa's former Lieutenant Governor on how the courts have interpreted antitrust laws to favor agriculture conglomerates. This has led to the collapse of a lot of rural for arming livelihoods and thus led me to be interested in looking at if antitrust laws aren't protecting small farmers and competition as they're intended to, I had the hypothesis that they weren't protecting regenerative farmers either, who I predicted are more likely to operate on smaller scales. Switch. To answer my questions, I started with investigating the level of consolidation in the agricultural sector using USDA data to track what types of practices farmers of different sizes implemented. 
From this, I found that the United States has lost almost 500,000 farms from 1975 to 2018, while the average size of farms has increased over 50 acres, the size equivalent to 66 football fields. This has shown a trend of consolidation in the farming industry. In regards to farming practices, switch, in 2017, 32.7% of small farms, the green bar, used compost or organic fertilizers, which I define as regenerative fertilizers, while only 27.3% of medium farms, the pink bar, and only 21% of large farms, the yellow one, used regenerative fertilizers. This showcases that small farmers are more likely to employ more regenerative practices. So to summarize, as the average size of the American farm is increasing and the number of farms is decreasing, this gives rise to dominant agricultural conglomerates. And these corporations are more likely to outcompete smaller farmers who are the ones more likely to employ regenerative practices, therefore hindering the growth of regenerative farming as my research is titled. Not only did I want to showcase this linkage, but I wanted to determine tangible flaws in our legal system that need to be addressed to truly identify pathways for remediation. Switch. This led me to create the question, what is causing the lack of antitrust enforcement in the US? Specifically, what legal tools exist that are not being implemented? Switch. Although I was bursting with excitement and interest to jump into my first legal research project, I found myself sitting in front of my computer, not sure where to start. Thankfully, the undergraduate law journal brought in Caitlin Hunter from the UCLA Law Library to introduce us to the resources our library could provide us access to. So LexisNexis, a legal research database books such as American Legal Writing to provide guidance on how to write a sound legal paper and her help are what Caitlin Hunter provided us. I took advantage of all of these resources and set up a meeting with Dr. Hunter to talk out my ideas and receive feedback from her. And after the meeting, I walked away more confident about finding a focus on what I was researching, what information I needed to find, where I could find it, and I was grateful for Dr. Hunter's materials and feedback that she shared. Now, I'm sure you've been itching to learn about what antitrust laws really are. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with them, they are policies created to promote fair competition and protect consumers by striking down monopolies and preventing the undue concentration of market power in the hands of very few corporations for an industry. The Clayton Act, Antitrust Act, is a landmark piece of antitrust legislation that where competitors can challenge a proposed merger if they prove that the merger would constitute antitrust injury. The key language of this legislation is in defining antitrust injury, which includes acts that may substantially lessen competition. Yes. And with any policies, as with any policies, the language can be interpreted in different ways. In this case, the courts and regulatory agencies, the Department of Justice, DOJ, and the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, have showed a trend of requiring more proof of burden before preventing mergers from forming. Next. So the first prong I analyzed was decreased investigations into mergers by the federal regulatory agencies. Switch. I found that despite an increase in merger requests across the decades, investigations by the DOJ and FTC have decreased. 125.3 cases per year were investigated from 1970 to 1979, while this decreased to 95.1 cases per year from 1980 to 1989, and finally, most recently, from 2010 to 2019, there were only 69.8 cases per year observed. So after seeing such a clear rise of non-precautionary attitudes towards antitrust enforcement in the federal agencies, I was curious to discover what led to this shift. Next, this led me to investigate the courts and their decision-making processes. 
So there has been a trend of a lack of enforcement from the courts while this while deciding rulings on antitrust cases, for example, in Cargill v. Montfort, the Supreme Court ruled that, switch, the threat of loss of profits due to possible price competition does not constitute antitrust harm. However, the purpose of the Clayton Act, as I mentioned earlier, is to prevent antitrust injury that may substantially lessen competition or tend to create a monopoly. This means that mergers should be able to, struck, to be struck down without requiring initial proof of ongoing established harm to the plaintiff. Therefore, my research found additional adverse impacts of consolidation on the market. Sorry, in addition. In 1991, small farms, defined as farms whose income is less than 350,000, took in 46% of agricultural profit, while in 2015, small farms only took in 25% of agricultural profit. Large farms who make more than 1 million, as presented at the top, held 31% of the gross cash farm income in 1991, while in 2015, their share increased to 51%. Therefore, we can see how consolidation in the agriculture sector has been occurring, and it has also had adverse impacts on farmers and consumers as well. Switch. 71% of poultry growers live below the poverty line. Switch. And from 1976 to 2006, post-merger prices, so the prices made after um, firms merged together, on average increased by 4.3%. These patterns demonstrate a disconnect between the current market conditions and the purpose to increase competition of the Clayton Act. Switch. Therefore, my research argues that the courts should set a new judicial standard that allows the threat of loss of profits due to possible price competition to constitute as antitrust injury and should be struck down when brought to court. They should instead default to precautionary measures and strike down mergers that have the capacity to acquire an undue percentage of the market share. Switch. My research highlights how consolidated corporate power can have myriad damaging effects both on the markets and the planet. We have a responsibility to curtail the dominance of large corporations through the legal framework in place and enforcement agencies responsible to carry out this work. I hope that my legal research can be used to spur information, reformation in our court legal and enforcement systems to stimulate competition and protect our food systems and environment for generations to come. I want to thank my editor, Olivia Bilski's managing editors, editors from the Undergraduate Law Journal, as well as the help and resources provided by UCLA's library and the Library Prize. Thank you again for listening. Please don't hesitate to reach out with questions or comments, and I hope to continue legal and policy analysis research around what programs are best supporting regenerative farming practices in four of the states I've lived in this past year, including California, Hawaii, Idaho, and now Nebraska. So look out for that next spring. Thank you, Jenny, back to you. Thank you so much, Kristen. Again, another really interesting presentation and project, lots to think about. So we've had the opportunity to hear from four of our prize winners about the work they did. I now want to invite everybody who's here to submit any questions uh, through the Q&A function that's on your, should be on your window, either at the top or the bottom. Uh, there's just a little button labeled Q&A, so please go ahead and submit any questions. Uh, and while we're waiting for questions, I do have one for each of our speakers today, which is to ask, which libraries did you use if you came to our physical libraries? And what resources did you find to be the most helpful? So maybe we'll go in reverse order. 
um, and see if uh, maybe Kristen, would you be willing to go first? Sure. Unfortunately, I was not around Los Angeles this past year, so I was only able to use the online databases that UCLA provided, including access through VPN to LexisNexis slash Nexus Uni for the legal research databases and court cases that I was analyzing, as well as um, the help of Caitlin Hunter from the law library, as I mentioned. That's great. Yeah, thank you. Yes, the, certainly being in a pandemic year, you did not have access to, to our, um, to come in and use the, the materials in the libraries. Um, did you take advantage of any of the services that we uh, ramped up, the mail service or any digitization services? Kristen? I do not believe that I did. Okay, I'm just curious. So it's, it's not a trick question. <laughs> So um, let me ask the same question of Tamar. Yeah, sure. Um, I actually go to Biomed like quite literally all the time. So I'm very glad that's open because it's pretty close to my apartment. Um, but before COVID, I would always go to Powell. And then in terms of online resources, um, I think I mainly use like the search database to find like peer-reviewed articles that I needed um, because it links really nicely to um, NASA's like online database um, and through the UCLA VPN you can access that so that was quite nice. Um, didn't order anything because everything I needed could be found online so that was convenient but I think that about covers it. Great thank you. JW how about you? Yeah, in terms of physical locations, I think uh, materials from music and arts as well as YRL were probably my most frequented places. Um, but the way, I guess the way my project was structured, it was more theoretical. Um, I didn't really rely on um, like archival materials. Uh, so it was a lot of monographs. It was basically most of my uh, material were, were full books. Um, and then kind of tracing uh, the bibliographies and kind of trying to uh, triangulate like networks um, of thought going on because it is drawing from um, since I'm looking at like representation and a bunch kind of a bunch of different um, disciplines coming to the fore um, that are kind of disparate in their in their um, intellectual histories. Um, so it's a lot of just finding a monograph um, and then kind of going through the bibliography and kind of working backwards from there and kind of trying to reconstruct um, all these kinds of uh, and that works basically, yeah. So in terms of um, that, the the basic kind of database search function was really helpful. Um, and I did request um, a lot of materials, uh, particularly books, once the um, document delivery stuff started rolling out, which was fantastic. Great, great, thanks. And it sounds as though you must have spent a fair amount of time on YouTube too, looking at, at <laughs> Fox videos. Oh yeah, so much time <laughs> scrolling through comments. Um, yeah, it was, it was a good time. <laughs> Did you use any sort of text mining or anything to get a sense of, of the comments to analyze them? I didn't actually, that's something I may look into if I continue down this line. I, the way I was, I was looking at it, I was kind of um, going really granular and only looking at like one specific instance um, and I think with the with the Kevy video that I was looking at mostly, it was I was just kind of focusing on that video. I had this kind of knowledge of um, I talk more about the kind of landscape it's situated within in terms of this like, not Renaissance but uh, just explosion in this kind of rescue fox uh, content. Um, and so I was aware of that and kind of situating it within that. But in terms of actually going into to comments and text, it was just on that one video. So luckily. Uh, I was able to actually get through all of them without any kind of uh, um, tool. But it, yeah, if I were to go forward on that kind of route, I would definitely use something like that. Great, thank you. And Anisha, how about you? 
Yeah, so most of the resources I used were online. I was not around in person, so I didn't use, need any physical resources. But yeah, I accessed everything through while I was connected to UCLA VPN, and then I requested some materials online um, when they weren't available to me from the library. Great, thank you. Well, we are almost out of time, so I, I do want to just take a moment to thank Anisha, JW, Tamar, and Kristen for your really fascinating projects and your presentations today. It's really exciting to be able to hear about them, and, and I find to hear your voice talking about the work you did. And it sounds as though there's lots more that you are probably thinking about already and thinking about uh, maybe next steps uh, to continue some of the projects. So, uh, so we'll be watching to see what happens. I also wanna thank everybody who came today. It's a great turnout and uh, wonderful that you can share with us our our happiness to have our library, some of our library prize winners talk about their work. So thank you so much for coming. And I hope you will come to other events, virtual and once we're back in person, our in-person events at the library. So thank you again, have a great afternoon and please take care everybody and be safe. Bye-bye. <laughs>